All right, good morning. I'm gonna uh, stall for just a minute or so uh, because what I found out a while ago was that uh, the streaming service I'm using to stream to Twitch and YouTube has like a little bit of a delay. So the very beginning of the YouTube stream is cut off. So I wanna make sure that um, I don't say important things. Uh, and I'm just gonna send out my tweet that says we're doing this. All right, good morning, everybody. It looks like doop, doop, doop. Uh, everything is working well. Make sure I mute myself so I'm not driving myself uh, around the bend. So this morning, we are going to be starting on a new paper, which is the BERT paper, um, which as you can see was submitted in October to Archive. Um, I believe, ah, good morning, Sunyam, uh, and Michael and Swaraj. Uh, and I see people have been hanging out for half an hour. That's dedication. I'm, I mean, you don't have to, but I'm, I'm glad that you're excited. Um, I don't believe this paper has been published in a uh, formal peer-reviewed publication venue. So I don't think it's been published in a um, computational linguistics. I guess you could publish in a journal. Most people tend not to. Um, conference is the, the main thing. Um, so I, I always have a little caveat when I'm talking about archive papers that you gotta, you know, be a little bit skeptical. Um, and this paper I've heard a lot of good things about from people I trust, but I am also, I have my, my little skepticism hat on. Uh, Swam says, hello Rachel and Gustav. Oh, thank you. He is asleep right now. Gustav is my, uh, my hedgehog. So he is uh, awake at night and asleep during the day. All right, so let's get started with the PDF. And I haven't, um, done pretty much any preparation for this. So I try to show you guys the whole process and not, you know, read the paper sneakily ahead of time and be like, oh, I understand all the math perfectly on the first run through. <laughs> um, I know that it's bidirectional, which is um, something that with um, RNNs and specifically LSTMs has been um, holding state of the art in a lot of tasks for quite a while. Um, also, we know that transformers, if you if you watch the transformers paper, um, use attention. So this is bidirectional with attention. Um, and I'm thinking that it's going to be very similar to BIOS LSTMs. Um, and also it's using pre-training. So those are the things I know about it. Uh, so Nyam says, uh, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, I was, um, I did a, a little um, interview for, for your blog. Which was very fun. Thanks for in inviting me. Uh, yeah, so let's hop into it. I'm thinking that we're probably going to end up with uh, quite a few detours as I try to get my head around the math. And thankfully, we just read the Transformer paper, so I am um, hopeful <laughs> that this will be, uh, you know, not, not too difficult, uh, given the, the background we have. So, oh, and I do want to say this is also a Google paper, and the last paper we read was a Google paper as well. I am not specifically seeking out Google papers. I'm not saying like, oh, the best NLP research is all from Google. Um, it's These are papers that people specifically requested. Um, so that is that is where I'm getting this list of papers. I'm not specifically seeking out Google, um, and I'm very happy to um, highlight uh, other scholars' work as well. Uh, Metalinks on uh, Twitch says, hi, everyone. Hi, Metalinks. All right, let's get started with the reading. Uh, we introduce a new language representation model called BERT, which stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representations in trans from Transformers. Uh, unlike recent language representation models, Peters et al. 2018, Radford et al. 2018, BERT is designed to pre-train deep bidirectional representations by jointly conditioning on both left and right context in all layers. Um, Language representation model, is this the same as a language model or does it have something like... Da, 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 da. Okay, so Google thinks that it's just the same as a language model, which is sort of a way of um, describing words that are likely to occur together. Mm, contextualized representation, language model pruning, 
Well, the first page of Google results is not super helpful, so hopefully they will talk a little bit more about the task. Um, because when, so when they say language representation model, I'm thinking about a little bit like maybe, um, uh, maybe it's going to be more syntactic, nope, uh, semantic in nature. Maybe it's going to have um, more meaning representations, which they mention embeddings in here somewhere, maybe? I don't know. I get the idea that there's going to be embeddings involved, um, but I'm also wondering if there's going to be like relationships and agent patients so sort of like is x doing something to y also um discussed here and i don't know uh good morning bubble right uh, as a result the pre-trained bert representations can be fine-tuned with just one additional output layer to create state-of-the-art models for a wide range of tasks such as question answering and language inference without substantial task specific modif uh, architecture modifications so these are sort of a universal language representation that you can add use across different domains so transfer learning basically you're you're learning the space unit and then you can sort of tune it um, to do other tasks uh, so mom says it's a language model but like earlier ones where the task is a little different uh, and Sami Khan says, can't help that Google is one of the best research universities out there, I guess, lol, academia is shifting to industry. I mean, it do pay better. <laughs> um, slash there are any jobs, so. Shrug, I get it, I get it. All right, BERT is conceptually simple, we'll see about that, and empirically powerful. Uh, okay, that tells me we're probably not going to get a lot of theoretical justification for why this is the way it is, but I may be wrong about that. Uh, it obtains new state-of-the-art results on 11 natural language processing tasks, including pushing the GLUE benchmark to 80.4, 7.6% absolute improvement, uh, multi-NLI, probably natural language inference, I don't know about GLUE, uh, to 87.6, 5% improvement, and squad v1 v version 1.1 question answering test f1 to 93.2, uh, 1.5 absolute improvement. I believe squad is answering middle school standardized test questions. I'm fairly sure on that. Outperforming human performance by 2.0. And again, I think human performance here is middle schoolers, if I remember correctly. It might be um, elementary schoolers. Um, and I'm sure they'll, they'll talk about that a little bit more. So basically, they're training a representation that you can use across tasks, and it does state of the art, which, I mean, most uh, machine learning papers these days are going to claim. Okay, uh, Inri says, yay, Bert. Yeah, we're getting into it. All right, language model pre-training has shown to be effective for improving many natural language processing tasks. Um, citation, citation, citation. Um, okay, so it is just just a language model, this, this representation of the way that words are usually going to be ordered. Uh, these tasks include sentence level tasks such as natural language inference and paraphrasing, which aim to predict the relationship between sentences by analyzing them holistically, as well as token level tasks such as name entity recognition and squad question answering, where models are required to produce fine grained output at the token level. Okay, so the they're saying that you need language models for um, sort of like large structural things. So uh, natural language inference would be, I might ask you, um, I might have the, the input sentence, um, Robert has five cats. And then I would ask you, does Robert have any dogs? And you might say something like, I don't know. Or I might say, does Robert have any cats? And you would say yes. Um, so that's sort of, um, you know, logical inference using natural language. Paraphrasing is taking in one sentence and giving you out an equivalent to sentence um, in terms of meaning. Uh, named entity recognition is looking through a text and being like, oh, this is a thing that we know about. So like squad is an entity with a name. So you'd want to be like, oh, this is a specific thing that we know about. Um, and you can use that to, to link to knowledge databases and um, do more complex semantic work. And then squad question answering is answering questions. Okay, uh, there are two existing strategies for applying pre-trained language model, pre-trained language representations to downstream tasks, feature-based and fine-tuning. The feature-based approach, such as Elmo, uses task-specific architectures that include the pre-trained representations as additional features. Okay, I'm not super familiar with Elmo. Um, 
I honestly thought that it came after Bert because I started hearing about Bert first, but that's probably just like sampling bias on my my end. Um, so with Elmo, you you're still using the the architecture you're using for whatever tasks you are, but your pre-trained language model um, is just used as an additional feature. So I so the difference here is that instead of using something like a pre-trained embedding, which is fairly common to use, they're using a language model, which tend to be much more domain specific. Um, so if you think about it, you use different words in different orders in a um, like a scholarly paper than you do, you know, on Twitter. Um, but uh, the the claim that this paper is making is that they have a language model that can be used across tasks. Um, certainly not across languages. I would be shocked if they make that claim. Um, Mm, mm. I'm wondering how well it works across domains as well and about genre effects. We'll find out. Uh, and Swam says, Bert came after Elmo. Ah, thank you. Uh, Inri on, on Twitch says, same, I found out about Elmo after Bert. Weird. Uh, I don't know if Elmo's out of Google or not, uh, but I do know that the, uh, uh, the research teams at Google do a really good job of, um, you know, publicizing their results. Recency bias. Okay, um, the fine-tuning approach, such as the Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, OpenAI GPT, Redford et al. 2018, introduces minimal task-specific parameters and is trained on downstream tasks by simply fine-tuning the pre-trained parameters. So this would be updating the parameters that you put in. Um, as opposed to this, so Elmo doesn't change the input parameters. Uh, OpenAI GPT does change the inp input parameters, but just like a little bit. In previous work, both approaches share the same objective function during ooh, same objective function during pre-training, where they use unidirectional language models to learn general language representation. Um, so basically, a unidirectional model says, "I'm this is word one, this is word two, this is word three. I model word one, and then word two, and then word three. So things happen sequentially. Um, whereas in bidirectional, you look in uh, in addition to looking at word n, you look at word n minus 1, n minus 2, etc. Um, oh, so Bam says almost by the Allen Institute. Okay, good to know. Which is also in Seattle, by the way. Okay. Um, we argue that current techniques severely restrict the power of the pre-trained representations, especially for the fine-tuning approaches. The major limitation is that standard language models are unidirectional, and this limits the choice of architectures that can be used during pre-training. For example, in OpenAI GPT, the authors use a left-to-right architecture where every token can only attend to previous tokens in the self-attention layers of the transformer. Vaswani et al., that's the paper that we read before. Such restrictions are suboptimal for sentence level tasks and could be devastating when applying fine tuning based on fine tuning based approaches to token level tasks such as squad question answering. So they're saying that you want to be able to look at future tokens in addition to past tokens when designing your um, your language model or training your language model rather. Not much designing. Um, so Bam says, can we discuss how OpenAI Transformer is different from traditional Transformer we read about? Uh, <laughs> uh, you are welcome to tell me more about it, but uh, I haven't, I have not read the Elmo paper or the OpenAI GPT paper, so shrug. I mean, we could at some point, I just, I don't have the background for it now. Uh, could be devastating when applying fine-tuning based approaches to token level tasks such as squad can't question answering uh, where it is crucial to incorporate context from both directions okay yeah interesting is this for language generation language understanding so I guess, so the, the thing that um, I'm thinking about here is this is a cognitive model because I have, I got that, that human brain knowing things, behavioral training, um, and it's hard to turn that off. 
So for question answering, it makes sense to look forward and back because when you are answering a question, you've heard the question. Um, and I don't know what they're doing with OpenAI GPT. So it's just sort of a uh, transformer with fine tuning and they don't talk about the specific tasks they're doing. Um, but I guess it also makes sense to have language models specifically looking ahead as well as behind um, because you as a human are generating language and you know what you're going to say. So you, you sort of plan. It's actually really interesting. Um, uh, I have a friend at, oh goodness, where is she? I know she used to be at Oxford, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know where she is now. Um, where you actually plan your your sentence production in chunks. So you don't plan a whole sentence, but you plan like at the phrasal level. Um, and there's some really interesting experimental um, evidence around that. So I think it's it's reasonable to, to think about looking ahead and looking behind. Um, and I guess it's an empirical question. Does it improve our results? In this paper, we improve the fine-tuning based approaches by proposing BERT, bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. And if you don't know a lot about American culture, BERT and ELMO are both Muppets um, from Sesame Street. Um, so this is sort of a, a little cultural reference that, depending on your cultural background, you may or may not understand why it's a funny name. In this paper, we improve the fine-tuning based approaches by proposing BERT, blah, blah, blah. Uh, BERT addresses the previously mentioned unidirectional constraints by proposing a new pre-training objective, the masked language model, MLM, inspired by the close tasked Taylor 1953. I don't know what the close task is. Let's look it up. Help me Google. Uh, is an exercise, test, or assessment consisting of a portion of language with certain items, words, or signs removed, closed text, where the participant is asked to replace the missing language item. Oh, it's like a fill in the blank. They, okay, I guess it is a little bit less fancy to say fill in the blank than closed task, but that's what it is. The masked language model randomly masks some of the tokens from the input, and the objective is to predict the original vocabulary ID of the masked word based only on its context. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, I wonder, because this is one of the tests we use for um, lexical categories, so like is something a verb? Because a verb can, um, will always take the same position in a sentence. So if you can replace uh, a word with a different word in the same position with maintaining the same syntactic structure. Um, interesting, because you, historically you would have um, hand trained, like you would have gone through by hand and be like, apple is a noun, um, and, and done that for your, your whole vocabulary. Um, yeah, I'm interested to see if they talk about lexical categories in here. I'd be surprised, but delighted if they did. Unlike left to right language model pre-training, the MLM objective allows the representation to fuse the left and the right context, which allows us to pre-train a deep bidirectional transformer. In addition to the mask language model, we also introduce a next sentence prediction task that jointly trains, jointly pre-trains text pair representations. Okay, so instead of, so traditionally with a language model, you would look at tokens if you're trying to predict token n, you'd look at token n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, etc. Um, so for, uh, I don't know, so, so one thing you might do is you might use n-grams um, and a, um, a Markov chain to generate language and to model language. Um, which only looks at two tokens together and where the um, next token is dependent only on the, you know, whatever your n-gram is n minus one previous tokens. So this is looking at more context is the big difference here. All right, uh, and I don't really get the next sentence prediction thing, but presumably they will talk about it more. The contributions of our paper are as follows. We demonstrate the importance of bidirectional pre-training for language representations. Unlike Redford et al., we use unidirectional language models for pre-training, oh, which uses un unidirectional language models for pre-training. BERT uses masked language models to enable pre-trained deep bidirectional representations. 
So Radford et al. is the um, the Elmo paper. No, Radford et al. is the um, OpenAI GPT paper. And uh, they're putting their work in contrast to that. Uh, and the big thing is that they look in both directions. So the language before, the words before and after the target word. Uh, this is also in contrast to Peter's 2018, which uses a shallow concatenation of independently trained left to right and right to left language models. So Peter's trains two language models, one going left to right, one right to left, and then shallowly concatenates them, I guess, just like glues them together, looks at both of them. Um, oh, Arnav says Peter's at all is the Elmo one. Okay. So Peter's at all actually is looking in both directions. For, to the right and to the left, but instead of looking at both directions at the same time, they're looking in both directions independently, is, is the difference that they're suggesting here. All right. Uh, we show that, so this is the, that was the first contribution, is that they do something different than people did previously, which is good scholarship. Uh, secondly, we show that pre-trained representations eliminate the needs of many heavily engineered task-specific architectures. So saying this is more general. BERT is the first fine-tuning based representation model that achieves state-of-the-art performance on a large suite of sentence level and token level tasks, outperforming many systems with task-specific architectures. So they're saying you don't have to you know, figure out what your network's going to look like independently for every different task. You can use the sort of the same general um, representation architecture whenever you need a language model, um, which eh, it seems good. Um, less time guessing and testing, right? And uh, less compute spent, less, you know, fuel burn to, to supply that compute, that sort of thing. So I, that sounds good. Uh, and then finally, BERT advances state of the art for 11 NLP tasks. We also report extensive ablations of BERT, demonstrating the bidirectional nature of our model is the single most important new contribution. Okay, so they um, they compare BERT to their same model, removing all of the so model X that has all of the features, model X sub one that has all the features except for one, um, model X sub two which has all the features except for a different one, and so on. Uh, I think is what they're what they're talking about. Uh, the code and pre-trained model will be available at this address, and I think it is. It is not. One sec, let me. So the link in the paper is broken, but if you copy and paste the link, it does work. Um, and it was last updated November 23rd. Oh, Thai and Mongolian. Okay, okay. So uh, Thai and Mongolian are not related to each other, I believe. I believe Mongolian is Finno-Ugric? No, no, it's not. I think, is it Turkic? <sighs> I'm just gonna quickly look up, quickly look up the Mongolian uh, language family, uh, Mongoliac. That's not super helpful. Proto-Mongoliac. Well, Turkic Altaic. Anyway, it's a very different language from Thai, which is a very different language from English. Um, so it's nice to see that they're they're working on uh, multiple languages uh, that are not genetically related to each other. Because I'm I'm not, you know, I'm not usually the most convinced when someone is like, our model is multilingual. It works equally well on German and Dutch, which are very closely related languages that are very similar to each other. Um, also, as it turns out, not everybody in the world speaks English. Uh, Bubble Ride says, where are the linguists who know Mongolian? Um, there are quite a few, actually. Um, uh, there were a couple in my program who worked on it, Dan and Sarala. Um, there's obviously a lot of uh, the, the scholars, linguists in Mongolia at Ulaanbaatar University are working on Mongolian. Um, yeah, and Vishal says, uh, Shabam, maybe you can refer to the blog post by Jay Alamer titled this one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I did look it up. So uh, Jay Alamer did a really nice uh, blog post on the Illustrated Transformer that we used a lot of during 
while we were reading that paper. Um, so that was that was uh, very helpful, and I didn't want to. Well, we, we might use it a little later on, but they're using a lot of, they're talking about a lot of different models in one here. So we'll see. All right, uh, let's go back down to where we are. Uh, related work. There's a long history of pre-training gen general language representations, and we briefly review the most popular approaches in this section. Um, Polaris says, uh, it is Altaic, Altaic uh, which is the Turkic, Mongolian, and Manchu Tungus language families. Thank you, that is helpful. It's been a minute since I did topology, linguistic topology. Uh, so the previous work on language representations, feature-based approaches. Uh, learning wildly applicable representations of words has been an active area of research for decades, including non-neural, uh, some citations there, and neural, more citations, methods. Um, that's nice. Uh, for, for machine learning papers, citing back to 1992 is like deep in the literature. And uh, there was the citation to 1953, but um, it was tangential. It wasn't from the machine learning literature. So, uh, Pre-trained word embeddings are considered to be an integral part of modern NLP systems, offering significant improvements over embeddings learned from scratch. Uh, these approaches have been generalized to coarser granularities, such as sentence embeddings, mm, or paragraph embeddings. Mm, I'm not a huge fan of either of those things. Uh, as with traditional word embeddings, they learned representations. The learned representations are also typically used as features in a downstream model. ELMO generalizes traditional word embedding research along a different dimension. They propose to extract context-sensitive features from a language model. When integrating contextual word embeddings with existing task-specific architectures, ELMO advances the state-of-the-art for several major NLP benchmarks, including question answering on squad, sentiment analysis, and named entity recognition. So context-sensitive features. So they're not training in embeddings or are they embeddings across engrams i'm not entirely sure um uh ona says mongolian sentence structure is similar to turkish language yeah oh, and they're both um for someone who speaks a language that does not have a lot of morphology, they got a lot of morphology. I think Mongolian has like 15 cases. Um, and they also have like evidentials. Did you see this occur or did you hear that it occurred from someone reliable? And that's incorporated grammatically with little, little word bits. Um, my dad speaks Mongolian and I have very little faith that I would be able to uh, learn the language to the same degree. It seems hard. Okay, uh, fine tuning approaches. So hopefully we'll come back and talk more about what's, hopefully they'll come back and talk more about what's what's going on in Elmo, uh, or we might need to take a little detour and uh, check that paper out the, the same. Um, Polaris says, Turkish has the same thing. Oh, Arnav says, uh, the Elmo trained a language model to pick out different set of weights, which are used in its embeddings based on the task. Okay, interesting. So the, so they're using the attention from the transformer model. Wait, no. Was Elmo a transformer model? I know the open AI was. Okay, no. I don't think Elmo was a transformer. I think it's the open AI GPT that was a transformer. Uh, and Sabam so says, same words have different embedding based on context. Okay, okay. So they are embeddings, but they are context dependent. Okay. Interesting. And then they mention that the context-dependent embeddings use a shallow concatenation of independently trained left-to-right and right-left language models. So this is presumably for picking which of, the, excuse me, which of the embedding weights you are using for a given word in a given context. Uh, and Arnoff says Elmo is by LSTM. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So the difference, in addition to being bidirectional, is that this is using a transformer and Elmo is using um, bidirectional LSTMs, which are a um, 
a type of recurrent neural network. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, very helpful. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And they also got state of the art because that's how you get machine learning papers noticed these days. All right, fine tuning approaches. A recent trend in transfer learning from language models is to pre-train some model architecture on a language model objective before fine tuning the same model for a supervised downstream task. And some citations. Um, the advantage of these approaches is that few parameters need to be learned from scratch. At least partly due to this advantage, OpenAI GPT achieved previously state-of-the-art results on many sentence-level tasks from the GLUE benchmark. Okay, so this is fine-tuning language model. So it, it's transfer learning. Oh, okay, I see, I see. So the feature-based approaches are using the language models as inputs and the fine-tuning approaches are using transfer learning to update your language model for your task-specific thing. Okay, that makes sense to me. Uh, transfer learning from supervised data. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna look up this GLUE benchmark because I still don't know what it is. Tell me more about GLUE benchmark. A multitask benchmark and analysis platform for natural language understanding. Um, so, blah, 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 a tool for evaluating the performance of models across a diverse range of existing NLU tasks. It's model agnostic, but incentivizes sharing knowledge across tasks because certain tasks have very limited training data. We further provide a handcrafted diagnostic test suite that enables detailed linguistic analysis of NLU models. We evaluate baselines based on current models for multitask and transfer learning and find that they do not immediately give substantial improvements over the aggregate performance of training a separate model per task, indicating room for improvement in developing general and robust NLU systems. Okay, so it's like a, a meta-analysis across a number of tasks. So in order to do well on Glue, you have to have a model that is capable of um, working in a number of contexts. Okay, that's interesting. Oh, and that is also from 2018, which is probably why I have not run into it previously. Or maybe I have and I just forget about it. Okay, well, the advantage of unsupervised pre-training is that, sorry, I made syntax bad. Well, the advantage of unsupervised pre-training is that there is a nearly unlimited amount of data available. Ah, sounds like you worked on English, my dude. Uh, there has been, no work, there's also been work showing effective transfer from supervised tasks with large data sets, such as natural language inference and machine translation. Outside of NLP, computer vision research has also dem demonstrated the importance of transfer learning from large pre-trained models, which are an effective, where an effective recipe is to fine tune models pre-trained on ImageNet. Uh, dang it all, and the ImageNet folks. So, okay, so we haven't gotten to figure yet, figure one yet. The advantage, sorry, I, do, I don't under, I read it aloud, but I'm not understanding the words that I read good. Uh, unsupervised pre-training is that there's nearly unlimited amount of data available. So the benefit of unsupervised means you don't have labeled data. So you can look at any data, it doesn't have to be labeled, which I think is what they mean by nearly unlimited. Um, but the supervised tasks mean that this is a specific task. You're training a language model for a specific task and then moving it. Effective transfer for supervised, supervised pre-training. So I'm not sure what they're transferring to here outside okay so i'm just i think they're just saying that transfer learning from supervised data is possible um so language models aren't supervised you generally have just like a big collection of text and that's what you're using to inform your um, models guesses about what might come next uh, and what what patterns tend to show up in language for a very loose definition of pattern. Um, 
And they're saying that you can also do this if you are working towards improving on a specific task and it doesn't just work um, for things like language models, but they're working on language models. So, okay. I think they're saying that this is a general enough approach that will also work on supervised tasks is what that, that little bit is saying there. All right, finally, BERT, we're getting into this model. We introduce BERT and its detailed implementation in this section. Uh, Polaris says maybe semantic analysis. Uh, I'm not sure where we, maybe was that was from when I was asking what um, uh, was happening, what task they were moving towards. Uh, fish eyed said thought I was the only one who had to unpack every paragraph in these documents lol Nope, sometimes I read it through the first time and I'm like, I know all those words and in that order They still make sense to me, but sometimes I'm just like why why did you say that? I don't understand Okay, finally getting into Bert uh, introducing BERT, detailed implementation uh, We first covered the model architecture and the input representation for BERT Okay, we then introduce the pre-training tasks, the core innovation on this paper in section 3.3. Um, so the first they're just going to sort of do the boilerplate and then they're going to talk about the things that they did differently. Um, the pre-training procedures and fine-tuning procedures are detailed in section 3.4 and 3.5 respectively. Finally, the differences between BERT and OpenAI GPT are discussed in section 3.6. Okay, and they're not contrasting it with ELMO because ELMO doesn't use the same architecture because that's bidirectional LSTM, and they are talking about OpenAI GPT because that's another transformer model. This makes sense to me. It's all coming together. All right, model architecture. And a little sip of coffee before we get into that. Sorry, I'm trying to look away from the mic so it's not like, you know, a horse at a trough sort of sound. All right, BERT's modeled architecture is a multi-layer bi-directional transformer encoder based on the original implementation described in Vaswani and released in the Tensor to Tensor library. So Vaswani had an encoder and a decoder. It was specifically looking at um, translation so it looks like this is just going to be the first half of the model uh, and let's really quickly pull that up just to get a little a little visual i always try and click the, click the link to the version of the paper that was actually published so um, this is the encoder, this is the decoder, and we're only going to be looking at this first half, the encoder, which makes sense because what we're getting out is a language model and not a, um, you know, a, a second sequence. Um, so Baum says, idea is to use large data for unsupervised language model task, uh, and then when we transfer that model to supervised tasks like sentiment analysis, where small amount of labeled data will work well. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, I guess the, the thing that they're, they're getting at is that you can do that transfer. Showing effective transfer from supervised tasks. But they're not, I don't think they're training, they're doing supervised training here. No, anyway, we'll, we'll get to it when we, uh, uh, make sense. Uh, Ryan, the secret trick to reading papers is to fast scroll down to the results table and then copy paste from GitHub if the results are good. No, Ryan. I mean, that is one way to compare things, but you don't know if like, they, you know, that, that's just like, I know you're being snarky, but that upsets me <laughs> a little bit. Then you don't understand the math. You don't know what's going on. Um, my biggest sort of gripe about machine learning research right now is that there's not good theoretical groundwork. Um, so that makes it hard for us to know, to form hypotheses about why different architectures might do different things. Um, like sometimes we know, but sometimes we don't. So it's like, 
don't know, it's like tuning tuning hyperparameters and you don't know whether the hyperparameter you're tuning is like parabolic and there's like a sweet spot that will work really well and you want to get to that sweet spot or it's asymptotic and it's just always going to go down as long as you keep throwing stuff at it. Um, and if you don't know that, then you might just keep throwing stuff at it. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. Anyway, uh, Fisheye had said, can you briefly remind us what supervised and unsupervised training is? I know it should be obvious. I don't think it's obvious at all. Um, so unsupervised is when you have data that you don't know the labels for. Um, so it's it's for tasks where you are not doing classification generally. So clustering is generally unsupervised because you just have a bunch of things and you know some qualities that they have um, and you want to know which things are most like each other um, and you don't necessarily need to have labels for that. But supervised would be I have a bunch of things, I know what quality they have, and I also know what group they already belong to. So I'm just training a model to figure out, given a new thing, which which group should I put it in, if that makes sense. I'm using my hands to like uh, show the two-dimensional space that these objects are in. But yeah, good question. Uh, okay, so the the thing that is most different so far, besides obviously the bidirectional um, bit, is that we are only doing the first half of the model and not the second half, the decoder. Because use of the transformer has become ubiquitous recently, has it? Uh, and our implementation is effectively identical to the original, we will omit an exhaustive background description of the model architecture and refer readers to Vaswani. Fortunately, we read that last. Uh, so you guys can go back and, and watch those videos. Uh, as well as a uh, excellent guides such as the annotated transformer. Mm, boop. Oh no, I wanted that in a new tab. Oh well. Okay, we did look at this. Um, but I don't think we actually read through it in, in much detail, but this might be another good um, reference for you if you were, you were interested. Uh, Ryan says, this is just me being pedantic, but I'd argue word to vec and other unsupervised, quote unquote, pre-training methods are actually supervised. We don't start with labels, but in essence, we break down the problem into a bunch of supervised predictions. That's true. Yeah, I can see, I can see that point. How do I get my paper back? <laughs> I think I, I went one too far here. Um, yeah, I can see your point. Uh, picking back up. And I, I should be better about um, opening things in new tabs. Uh, all right, the annotated transformer. Uh, Arnav says, Yan Lakun Sat Lakun? calls it self-supervised, it's hard to say. I think it's a little bit arguing over semantics. And despite NLP being close to linguistics, I think people tend to care less about semantics. All right, in this work, we denote the number of layers, i.e. transformer blocks. So this one, so this is one transformer block, I think. Um, or maybe it's all of this. Does that include the feed forward network? as L, the hidden size is H, so it's, uh, H is the number of sort of like times you do attention independently. Um, and if you weren't here for um, the other paper, V, K, and Q are all um, trained. Um, so this is the value, the key, and the query, which I think are very unhelpful names. Uh, Doomkeru says, can it generate new words? So it should be able to. Um, so it should be able to. So the way that they described it up here is that you, they're training it to, um, uh, uh, fill in the blank using a mask, which means that you should, you know, if you have part of a sentence, it should be able to generate a guess of the rest of the sentence. Um, Oh, oh, you meant out of vocabulary. So Arnav says not once in the vocabulary. No, yeah, you'll probably get an UNK token if it's like, it's probably something, I don't know what it is. Uh, 
blah, 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 blah. So uh, H, which is the same thing they said, the number of um, sort of little attention uh, tensors that are stacked up together. And in all cases, we set the feed forward filter size to be 4H, e.g. 3072 for H equals 768 and 4096 for H equals 1024. We primarily report results on two model sizes. Uh, the base BERT model is L equals 12, so that's the number of transformer blocks. So I think the transformer block that they're talking about might be both of these, both the multi-headed attention and feed forward networks together, and then they're sort of stacked repetitively on top of each other. Uh, H equals 762, A uh, self-attention head, so 12 self-attention heads, and then 110 million parameters. Um, Sand says, how is it creating attention, n layers of attention? So that's what we talked about here. Um, what was that? What we talked about in this paper, and it is. I gotta, I gotta dust this one off. Um, I think. Layers of attention inside n layers of attention, number of self attention heads. So I think, which one of these did they call a multi head self attention layer? My multi head attention over there. Blah, 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 blah. So I think each of these layers is a head, but oh, so maybe the thing that they're calling A in here is what they're calling H here. And the number of self-attention heads is H, the hidden size. H. Oh, maybe that's the hidden size in the feed forward. Hmm. And then they have another one that has L equals 24, so twice as many layers, transformer blocks. Hand size H, self attention heads A. So I think A here is actually H here, which means that the hidden size is. Is that the number? Okay, so. Is that the number of multi-headed attention layers within each tensor layer? Um, Ryan says 768 is the size of the pre-trained embeddings, if that helps at all. Pre-trained embeddings. Okay, hit size is H. So is that the size mm, you know what i'm giving up <laughs> do you have a good explanation for us uh model architecture so here's the base here's the large so okay so it looks like the l is the number of encoders that are stacked up on top of each other so this is the encoder bit so this is what would have been referred to as uh, capital N in the original attention paper. So there's 12 layers of those transformer bits. The, so Ryan on Twitch says 768 is the size of the pre-trained embeddings, which is also the number of the hidden layers. So this must be the width, I'm guessing. And then A is the number of self-attention heads. Wait, L and A are the same size. Are they the same size for this one? They are not the same size for this one. Okay, so L and A vary independently. I've got too many tabs open, too many tabs. Let's close a bunch of these. 
Oh, yeah. Um, I also uh, was reading that someone said that this was the first time that transfer learning had been done. And I was like, surely that's not right. And then I remembered Anders Sogard talking about it. But I think most of his work was actually on multitask learning, not transfer learning. Um, anyway, that's what I was looking up in those tabs. All right. Do you have a helpful picture anywhere? Like up here, do you talk about L? Difference in pre-training? Nope, nope, none of these are labeled for what your parameters mean. Are any of these labeled for what your parameters mean? Do you have a nice, a nice diagram? Nope. Um, okay, I don't know what some of these parameters are. Do you have it in your blog? No. Well, that's helpful. Um... Let's see. Larger feed forward networks, more attention heads than the default configuration. Six, eight attention heads. So in the default implementation of the original paper, there were eight attention heads. Here there are 12 and 16. Uh, let's look in this. Tell me more about attention heads. Eight attention heads. Multi-head attention, that's a, that's a, eight sets for each encoder, decoder, which matrices. Okay, okay, okay. So the number of attention heads is what is called H in here. So it's the number of um, attention layers you are trying, you're, you're training simultaneously. Although they're not really layers because they're not on top of each other, they're next to each other. More like um, leaves i guess like book leaves in that they're next to each other and not on top of each other when the book is on a shelf and not like flat on a desk uh, maybe not the best, best metaphor okay so they have a lot of attending at once that's what the a is the h is maybe that's the the size of the embedding so it here would be the X. So the the here's so the first word is the word thinking and the second word is the word machines and then the embeddings are four for each of them which is obviously very small. Um, for for embeddings usually you'll do something like you know five hundred or, or up there, um, or more. Okay, so they have twelve encoder units stacked on top of each other. Um, the embedding length is 768 or for the bigger one 1024 they have 12 attention heads so they are simultaneously learning 12 different um, little matrices for for self mask of attention okay and these are these are each trained independently if they only have encoders so q and v and k all of these are all going to be in each level of the encoder trained independently. So that's what the, the attention part is, is the output of V and K and Q um, using using this. So you use K and um, Q together to sort of like get the attention, uh, the weight for the word, and then V upweights the, the word sort of in its um, context. Okay, uh, Shabam says H is larger feed forward network units, which were 512 in the original paper. Okay. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then the bigger one is bigger. So BERT base was chosen to have an identical model size as OpenAI GPT for comparison purposes. Critically, however, the BERT transformer uses bidirectional self-attention, while the GPT transformer uses constrained self-attention, where every token can only attend to the context on its left. Okay. So this is the, the, um, uh, this is the major uh, contribution of this paper, and they're going to talk about it in section 3.3, I have been promised. Uh, blah, 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 blah. so GPT only looks at it's the past, BERT looks to the past and the future. We note in the literature that a bi-directional transformer is often referred to as a transformer encoder, 
Well, left context only version is referred to as a transformer decoder since it can be used for text generation. The comparisons between BERT, OpenAI, GPT, and ELMO are shown visually in figure one. So um, what, they, what they're saying there is that in, doop, 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 uh, in this model, the encoder, um, which is sort of taking the input string and um, passing it to the, the part of the model that's generating the output string, looks at the whole string at once, but in the output, um, when I'm when I'm generating text, I only look at the tasks that I have already generated and then the input text to figure out what comes next. I don't look at things that I haven't generated yet, if that makes sense, um, which sounds weird, but this isn't happening sequentially. It's happening um, uh, parallelly across all positions in the output. Um, so again, a little bit weird if you think about language, like the way that you talk human. <laughs> Um, but in terms of good optimization for graphics card and parallel processing, graphics card, graphics cards and parallel processing, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do things parallelly instead of sequentially, because then you don't have to wait for the last step. You can just do steps and through and the last end that you have instead of step n and then n plus one and then n plus two. Okay. Um, so that's what they're talking about here, that it's the decoder that doesn't look to the future. Uh, and they are comparing them in figure one. So um, this is what I might call a fully attentive network or FAN as well. Some people have called that. So we have, what is E? What is T? Differences in blah, 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 blah. Among the three, only BERT representations are jointly conditioned on both right and left context and all layers. Okay, so this must be transformer layers. So this is the word at time step one, time step two, time step three, and this is the wait for that word, I guess, sort of the um, output. But wouldn't they, for a language model, wouldn't they be predicting the next word? Interesting. Uh, and so in OpenAI, they only look at previous words. In Elmo, they look at previous and past words, but doing that using two separate LSTM networks. And in BERT, they look at previous words and future words. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that E and T are words? Hmm. Okay. Um... I might call it a day there. So we got to page, like two, page three, not too bad. Um, yeah, I think I'm pretty good on what L, H, and A are. Um, I wish that they had used the same letters as the original paper instead of using different letters for the same thing because that's extremely confusing to me personally. Um, and I get, I, I definitely get the difference between their model, uh, the OpenAI transformer model and the Elmo model. Um, so I, I understand the, the differences in what they're looking at. Um, I don't entirely know how their bidirectional attention works, but that is going to be coming up in this nice juicy section down here. Uh, and it looks like they have a nice sort of walkthrough with lots of examples, which I'm looking forward to reading. Um, uh, and I guess the sort of the point of the, the model architecture section is that they used the same model architecture that everyone else has. So. I don't think the authors want us to focus a lot on this section, um, and I may need to go back and uh, skim this paper again. So this is the paper that we read um, over like three weeks. Okay, so I will be streaming again on Friday. Um, I will be doing live coding, and I'm actually working on a transformer for taking in modern English text and putting out early modern English text, so very lightweight sort of translation task. 
Um, and I will probably not be back next Wednesday or Friday. I'm going to be, um, traveling, but I might record something. I don't want to, I don't want to promise that if I'm not actually going to do it. Uh, but yeah, so if you're going to join me on Friday, I'll see you on Friday. Um, if not, I'll be back for sure Wednesday after next. Um, so I will definitely see you then. Um, and we might, we might jump back in with this paper. Uh, we will definitely come back to this paper. It might be next week. It might be week after next. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, I've got a, a meeting I need to get to, unfortunately, so I can't stick around. Uh, but I will talk to you guys later. Goodbye.